Good morning and welcome. Let's stand as you worship.
good to be here together. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and bless them past the peace of Christ. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Oak Hills Church. We are so happy that you are here joining us, whether you're here or here online. Uh, we thank you. Uh, we are at the start of a new year, and we are at the start of a new series exploring the life and wisdom of King Solomon. Should be pretty exciting. Mike and Dave have been working on this a lot, so we're excited to see what they've got in store for us. This morning, our call to worship comes from 1 Chronicles 29. It's a prayer of King David. So let's say this together. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you. And praise your glorious name. Amen.
thank you for who you are, for our trust in you, for our hope in you, Lord. The stories that you've taken us through, we have hope and faith of the stories that you will bring us through. In your name we pray, amen. And please be seated. Good morning, everybody. I haven't seen some of you, so happy new year. Um, we're going to continue to worship together, but at this point, as is our custom, we're going to uh, dismiss our children to their classrooms. So first through fifth graders, you know who you are. You can stand, and the rest of us extend a hand towards them. Let's bless them. Father, Son, and Spirit, we lift up our children up to you. May you bless them and keep them. May your face shine upon them. May your grace be upon them. May your countenance be lifted up to them, and may you grant them peace. The Lord be with you. And you can be dismissed. Um, as we continue to worship together, I am going to lead our uh, community prayer today. Um, I uh, found a Puritan prayer for the new year. I'm going to use that as our worship. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord. Length of days does not profit us, except the days are passed in thy presence, in thy service, to thy glory. Give us a grace that precedes, follows, guides, sustains, sanctifies, aids every hour, that we may not be one moment apart from thee, but may rely on thy spirit to supply every thought, speak in every word, direct every step. Prosper every work, build up every mote of faith, and give us a desire to show forth thy praise, testify thy love, and advance thy kingdom. We launch our ship on the unknown waters of this new year with thee, O Father, as my harbor, thee, O Son, as our helm, thee, O Holy Spirit, filling our sails. Guide us to heaven with our loins girt, our lamp burning, our ears open to thy calls, our hearts full of love, our souls free. Give us thy grace to sanctify us, thy comforts to cheer us, thy wisdom to teach us, thy right hand to guide us, thy counsel to instruct us, thy law to judge us, thy presence to stabilize us. In this new year, may thy fear be our awe and thy triumphs our joy. Amen. Father, Son, and Spirit, we want to lift up our ministry partners to you as well this year. All of them around the world and locally here in Folsom. And especially we want to lift up our friends Steve, Don, Bianca, and Sophia Liberty as they continue to do their, their your work in, in their spheres of influence with Proclaim. Ask, Lord, that you would bless them, you would protect them, that you would give them boldness in all the things that they do. And we lift up our sister churches here in the surrounding areas, and especially Hope Presbyterian this morning. As they gather, Lord, may your presence be um, evident in them. May you do a, a new work in them. Remind them again how much you love them. Give strength to Pastor Dave Husco and his elders, his leadership. And Lord, um, bless them abundantly this year. And Lord, you have blessed us abundantly. And we thank you so much for your goodness in the offerings that you've, that you've allowed us to um, uh, be generous with here at Oak Hills. And Lord, uh, uh, we ask that you would continue to do so. And as we receive our offering this morning, uh, Lord, may you use it to further your kingdom here and throughout the world. We love you, Lord. Amen.
Thank you to Steve and Manuel for that wonderful um, instrumental piece. Uh, good morning, Oak Hills Church, once again, um, and good morning to those of you who are streaming at home. My name is Ashley Hinson. I am the Director of Hospitality here at the church, um, and I just have a few announcements for you. Um, anything I say today can be found online at our website, oakhills.org, or on our app. Um, but first, I wanted just to welcome you again. If you are new, um, thank you for joining us this morning. I'd love to meet you and have a conversation with you, so feel free to see me out in the lobby. I have um, a gift for you as well, so um, yeah, I'd love to chat with you out there. Excuse me, out there. Uh, our first announcement is we have a campus work day coming up on January 29th. That is a Saturday from 8 a.m. to noon. So we're looking for people that are able to come and help us care for our campus. Um, we'll be doing things like spreading bark, sweeping, trimming trees, and um, caring for flowers, and um, just making sure that this campus is a really hospitable place for those that use it. So if you're able, we'd love for you to come and join us. Lunch will be provided for that. So um, just, just show up. You don't have to register or anything like that. Um, Manuel is requesting that if anybody has a video camera that they are no longer using, our camera team would love to repurpose it for our live stream services. Um, they need a camera that has a HDMI or a mini HDMI output. So if you have one of those, a little bit higher quality that you're looking to get rid of, you can contact Pastor Manuel. Our women's Bible study is starting up again on February 1st. Our own Jenna Glenn will be leading the women through the study. It is the, um, she's leading them through the community Bible study curriculum and will be teaching on the books of Philemon, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. This is not just a Bible study for Oak Hillians. It is for our entire community. So if there is someone that you would like to invite, please do so. You can look for the registration for that on our website or app. It should be up shortly. And lastly, um, I am looking for more hospitality team members, specifically on our welcome team. So if you have a desire to make our campus on Sunday mornings a little bit more of a hospitable, friendly place, then we would love for you to join the team. We have people that stand at the door and welcome. We have people that stand in the lobby and welcome, as well as in here. And we just want to make this a warm and welcoming place. So if you have a heart for that, please contact me, and I'll get you on a team, and we'll get you all set ready to greet some new people. And that. I have one other announcement I want to draw your attention to. Uh, regarding the year-end offering we received in December. And uh, we talked about that many times and what we're going to do with it, just to refresh your memory. Our year-end offering this year went to, uh, or is going to go to, the renovation of our outside spaces. And we are, have kind of, a, we're in the early stages of thinking all that through. The first step being to renovate and redo the playground for our children and potentially be able to use it for uh, children in the community, the apartments across the street, and so forth. And so we had a wonderful response to that. We are close to $90,000 just in our year-end offering alone, all of which will go to the playground renovation. 10%, of course, goes to an outside uh, missions person or someone who is uh, outside of our church or serving outside of our church. So this year we're giving it 10% uh, to Sean Young, so we think when it's all said and done, we're going to be pretty close to that 90000 amount. I think we're at about eighty-seven right now. There'll be a little bit more that comes in in the month of January. First of all, just a, a thank you for responding so wonderfully and so sacrificially. That will give us a great start uh, in this outdoor renovation. We have a meeting coming up with an architect in the area on January 27th where we are going to be presented with some more detailed plans about the playground and about some of the other spaces. And we're hoping that in the very near future, things will get rolling and we'll be on our way to uh, spending that money to renovate the playground and other things. So again, thank you. Just wanted to give you an update on that. Well, biographies are wonderful teachers. Uh, about a year or so ago, I read one on Richard Nixon, currently reading one on Ben Hogan, the famous golfer. And biographies are wonderful teachers because they have a pretty unique way of kind of pulling us out of our own paradigms and our own biases and transporting us into the shoes 
of another person. And from there, we at least have the opportunity to see and feel the world from their vantage point. And this can be wonderfully eye-opening and insightful if we're reading and paying attention. But at the same time, when it comes to biographies, in the words of Mark Twain, and here I quote, what a wee little part of a person's life are his acts and his words. His real life is led in his head and is known to none but himself. All day long, the mill of his brain is grinding, and his thoughts, not those of other things, are his history. These are his life, and they are not written. Every day would make a whole book of 80,000 words, 365 books a year. Biographies are but the clothes and buttons of the man. The biography of the man himself cannot be written. In other words, simplifying, there's always more to the story. So if we glance around this room, for instance, for just a moment, we might see a few people whose names we know, and we might know, using Twain's words, a wee bit about their life and story. We probably have impressions of some people in the room, even though we don't really know them. We all do this. We create profiles on others based not on real knowledge of who they are, but on our gut instincts or built-in biases or whatever. But here's the thing. Everyone in this room has a multi-volume biography filled with hundreds of thousands of pages. I cannot even begin to estimate how many times I have sat with someone in my office or in their home or in a restaurant somewhere, and they have shared a chapter or two of their biography with me, and I'm there, sitting there, and I'm left speechless. Those are such sacred conversations to be brought that far into a person's story. Their story sometimes contradicts the first impressions I had of them. At a minimum, their story informs and explains who they are and why. There's always more to the story. I believe every person has a depth to them beyond what they have so far explored. I want you to think about that as it relates to you. I believe every person has a depth to them beyond what they have so far explored. There's more to us, in other words, than we realize right now this moment today. So, the quick judgments we make about others, the razor-sharp labels we hang on others, the oversimplified reasons we offer to explain others rarely endure when the other's biography is revealed to us. Well, throughout the next several weeks, we're going to delve into the biography of this guy Solomon from the Old Testament, a fascinating character, a very complex character, as we're going to find out, a mixed bag of a character. A guy that really, when you start looking around and find out who's actually done stuff or said stuff or tried to write about this guy, what you find out is they essentially say two things. One, he was the guy who asked God for wisdom, and two, he was the guy who blew it at the end and finished poorly. But there's so much more to this guy. He was the son of David and Bathsheba. He was devoted to God off and on through his life. He became the king of Israel when he was very young. He actually describes it as saying, I was, I'm just a young child uh, when he became king. He reigned over Israel for 40 years. He was incredibly wealthy. Early in his reign, reign he asked God uh, in prayer for wisdom, and God gave it to him in abundance. He had a weakness for women. He wrote the Old Testament book of Song of Solomon, and he probably wrote Ecclesiastes, and his Proverbs, his wisdom, in other words, comprise the bulk of the book of Proverbs that we have in our Bibles. In his older years, as I mentioned, he walked away from God, and he finished rather poorly. So these are a few of the facts of his life, but our hope in this series is to try to stand in Solomon's shoes and do our best to see and think and feel the world from his perspective, and as we do so, to invite the Spirit of God to teach us about God, about this life, and about ourselves through Solomon's example. 
So I want to urge you to seize the restart of this new year and pursue God with us in this series beyond just sitting and listening to these talks we're going to give. And I want to give you three ways before I jump into this that you can be active in this and be a participant in this. And if you'll permit me, I'd like to push just a little so that we kind of go past that point of hesitation and we actually commit ourselves to doing a couple or all of these three things. The first is there are Bibles in your chairs. And they've been gone for a while for various reasons, but we're bringing them back. And I want to encourage you when we read our scripture readings and as we go through this, that you would turn to the to the uh, pages in the Bible where the scripture is. It'll be on the screen. You may be wondering why turn to it if it's on the screen. There's something about getting into it, opening it, looking at it yourself that I would encourage you to do. So as we go into this and go into our scripture readings, I want to encourage you to take one of the Bibles, turn to the passage, keep it open as we make our way through it, and that'll be one way to dive in and follow along. The second way you can do this is to participate in the daily reading plan that we have on our Oak Hills app. There's actually a new app. You're going to hear more about this. If you go to the app store and just type in Church Center, it will walk you through how to get to the new Oak Hills app. I think the old one actually uh, is now updated to the new one, but in any case, it's a fantastic tool. And we've put a reading plan on our app that will take us through the book of Proverbs and through the book of Ecclesiastes as we go through this series on Solomon. Obviously, both books, Solomon had a huge hand in writing, and the simple reading plan is to read one chapter a day of either Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, and it's all spelled out in there what the date is and what the chapter is, and it starts tomorrow, and I'd encourage you to do it. It will help fill in some of the gaps as we pick and choose what parts of Solomon's life we're going to be talking about. I know some of you have other devotional practices, but this is a way for us to journey together through Solomon's life. Again, it starts tomorrow morning. I'd encourage you to get the app, get it right now if you want to, and be ready to go with that tomorrow morning. And then the third way you can jump in a little deeper is to get a journal. You may have one already. We have them out at the welcome booth in the lobby and bring that with you into our time together. Not so much to take notes on what the people up here are yapping about, but to, if you want to, to draw, to scribble, to jot words down, phrases down, what, however you actively engage in terms of listening and uh, learning and assimilating, I encourage you to use a journal to do that. Again, we have a bunch of them. They're at the lobby in the uh, auditorium out in the lobby. They're at the welcome booth out there. And if you want one, you can go out there for five bucks. You can get one. If you don't have five bucks or you don't think it's worth five bucks, just say, I don't want to pay that, and they'll hand it to you for free. So you can't lose on this one. Feel free to go get one, bring it. Each week, scribble in it, draw on it, however, whatever you do to engage in, I would encourage you to do so. And with that, I want to ask you to stand for our scripture reading from this very fascinating person's life. And the first one is actually going to be two of them. Uh, I'm going to just give you the page numbers for, so you don't have to go fuddling around in that uh, Bible if you don't have it. The first page is 311. It's 2 Samuel chapter 12. And I'm going to just read two verses out of that, verses 24 and 25. And then just to get you ready, page 419 in the Bible's in your chair, which is 1 Chronicles 22. And I'm also going to read verses 6 through 13 from that, uh, from that chapter also. Again, I encourage you to turn there, leave it open when we're done, and we'll dive into this. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 24. We're going to get right into it. You're going to see this dude in full color right here. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. Okay, I guess we're into it now. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. Hold your finger there. Turn to page 419 or Second First Chronicles 22. I'll start reading in verse 6. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, but this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth 
in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon, and I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, this is David again talking to Solomon. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God as he said you would. May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. I want to start off by talking about this idea of less than ideal circumstances. Right out of the gate, we find in Solomon's story something I'm quite confident most of us can relate to, and that is his life began in less than ideal circumstances. Yes, he was born into a royal family, and that afforded him unique privileges beyond your average citizen, but like most of us, he was born into a set of circumstances that were chaotic and challenging, and he grew up in the midst of all kinds of chaos and challenge. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 24 simply says, David comforted his wife Bathsheba. But remember something. Remember David and Bathsheba became husband and wife when David misused his power as king and had an affair with Bathsheba, or at least he had a one-night stand with her. And then David orchestrated a series of events to have Bathsheba's husband killed. And then David tried to hide all this, and he did all this while he was the king of Israel. Their affair, or their one-night stand, produced a child, but the child died shortly after birth, and the Bible indicates that somehow this child's death was a consequence of David's sins. So Solomon is the second child of David and Bathsheba. So you just step back and look at this start to get into this biography a little bit, and you realize his early life, his beginnings, were kind of rough, and they had some hard things in it. But there's even more in terms of the chaos and the turmoil. His fa father was the famous king of Israel, David. I mean, David, to this day, is the penultimate king that Jewish people look to as the leader of Israel. David was a military genius, David was literally a superstar within the nation of Israel. And Solomon is born with all the expectations and pressures of a famous dad in a future leadership role. It's a really dumbed-down example, but this is what Charlie Woods is dealing with right now. His father, Tiger Woods, Charlie Woods, the son. You may not know this, but Tiger Woods and his ex-wife are in a little bit of a squabble over how much pressure to put on Charlie so he can be the next great golfer like his dad was. That's what Solomon was born into, but there's even more. In the scripture reading we read from 1 Chronicles 22, David says to his son Solomon, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. He's talking about the temple. David had a vision to build the temple. He goes on, but his word came to me and said, you're not to build a house for my name, for my name because you've shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Military genius. But you will have a son, God says. His name will be Solomon, and he is the one who will build a house for my name. I mean, let's just keep piling the pressure on this kid. One of his main purposes in life is already established before he's even walking. I mean, I guess it's no big deal. He's going to be the visionary, the fundraiser, and the general contractor on building a temple for the God of the universe. There's a bit of pressure there, I'd say. And I mention all of this about Solomon's early years and beginnings with the intent to inspire hope in us. Hope, first of all, in the relatability of the Bible 
to our lives and to our circumstances. So much of the Bible, as you may know, is narrative, meaning it's story. It's the story of God at work in this broken world and at work in broken human lives to bring his goodness and his love and his grace into the turmoil and into the chaos and literally transform it. So the Bible is an intersection where God meets humans in the real circumstances of their lives. People have, over the centuries, people have tried to convert the Bible into a rule book. They've tried to convert the Bible into a, an encyclopedia. And they've tried to mine it for answers and for principles and for rules. And there are certainly plenty of guiding principles and some answers and maybe even a few rules in the Bible, but before we get too far into this, we've got to realize this, the Bible is primarily story. And the Bible does not polish up the messy details of the story in order to pretty them for publication. And this is what makes it so relatable to your life and to mine. It is dealing with real people who are facing real life situations and they're trying to find and follow God in those situations. So let me say it this way, there's a fabulous realness in the Bible. And we're going to repeatedly discover this in the biography of Solomon. We've already discovered it. His father had an affair or a one-night stand, and, his, had, and then he had his mother's husband killed, or his one-night stand's husband killed. And then their child died, and then Solomon was born into these less-than-ideal and messy circumstances, and I find great hope in this. Because while fairy tales are fun and happily ever after is nice, there's a wall between the real world and the fairy tale world. And the Bible is the story of a real God intersecting with real people who are living in a real world, so it is relatable to what we are facing in our circumstances, whatever they might be. I also find great hope because all of us have our own rendition of the less than ideal story. Just pause for a moment and think back, look back, regardless of how young or old you are, just for a moment, look back, and undoubtedly when we look back, we can identify circumstances and events in our lives that, 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 that did not go the way we wanted. But like Solomon's biography, God has always been in our story. <clears throat> Somehow, he's been in our story. Somehow, as we look back along the way, all along the way, God has been in our story. And he's been working in our story and working in us to bring his goodness and love and grace into the messiness of our story and transform us and, and transform our story. I wonder if we all believe this. I realize how hard it is for some to believe God is in their messy story because their messy, messy story was or is so painful. And if God was there or if God is there, why not intervene, right? The great question that echoes all throughout history, why not intervene? If he was there or if he is there, why not intervene? I wish I knew the answer. But I do know this. Life is not a fairy tale. God is not a genie. The Bible does not lie. And God was present at the worst moments of our lives. And after those moments occurred, God's desire, was to bring his goodness and his love and grace into these messes and transform us and them for his purposes. Let's talk about less than ideal people. <clears throat> There's an, a line in the movie Steve Jobs, the movie's about the founder of Apple, that has haunted me ever since I watched it for the first time a number of years ago. I don't know whether it's true or not, it doesn't really matter. But Steve Jobs is talking with his daughter, with whom he has this combative and difficult relationship, and he's at the beginning point of coming to terms 
with how his own brokenness has hurt and damaged his daughter. And at one point during this heated exchange with his daughter, he says to her, I was poorly made. And again, it doesn't really matter if he actually said this. It's a haunting line. I was poorly made. I wonder if any of you ever feel that way. You ever feel like there are aspects of you that were defective from the moment you were shipped from the factory? <laughs> like something was broken right from the start. You got shipped with defects. Now, not everybody feels this way. Some of you are thinking, what is this guy, nuts? The answer to that is yes, but that's another story. But something was broken from the start. Not everyone feels this way, but some people do feel this way. And sometimes we may think of the people in the Bible as superheroes or superheroines. And we forget they were real people. They had screwed up families. They had sibling rivalries that resulted in all kinds of fights and anger and division and chaos. They got mad and their madness got out of control. They tried to get even. People in the Bible were deceptive. People in the Bible in one moment sang these praises to God and in the next moment sprinted as fast as they could away from God. They disobeyed him, and they obeyed him. They were also people who wanted to enjoy their lives. I think this might be the most elusive thing for us. The people we read about in the Bible were people who wanted to enjoy their lives and pursue a passion or two. We may think of them as these kind of stoic, sort of rigid, robotic creatures. We need to remember these were human beings. They wanted to enjoy their lives. They wanted to pursue a passion or two. They wanted to raise their children. They wanted to do something meaningful with their lives. They wanted to have a few laughs along the way. They were normal, real people that were discovering in the Bible. And Solomon had all of this. He wasn't a superhero. And thankfully, the Bible tells his story and all the other stories of the people in the Bible, and it tells it unfiltered and unedited. As we will see, the biography of Solomon has some remarkable chapters in it. David tells his son in our scripture reading, Now, my son, may the Lord be with you, and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God. May the Lord give you discretion, wisdom, and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. And Solomon followed this. Solomon experienced the richness of God's wisdom in his life. He was led by God through much of his life. But as I mentioned later in his life, he drifted away from God and he became unfaithful. And unfaithful or finished poorly is often the label hung on Solomon. Oh, he's the guy who had it all and then ruined it and finished poorly. His ego and his power and his insatiable sexual desire ruined him. These are the labels that get fixed to this guy. And it's true. Solomon finished poorly. His heart became divided. Near the end, God became one of many gods he worshipped. There's no doubt about any of this. But I bristle just a bit at reducing Solomon's 60-plus years of life and leadership to this single evaluation, valid as it may be. I prefer to say Solomon was a mixed bag of devotion to God and devotion to self, of listening to God's wisdom and following the impulses of his own ego and lust. The first king of Israel was a guy named Saul. He was a mixed bag. Started off well, but not too long into it. His pride got in the way. His jealousy just devoured his soul, and he finished his life poorly. David was the second king of Israel. He was, as he is described, a man after God's own heart, but as we read, his lust got in the way and created a whirlwind of sin and consequence. He then repented and he finished well, but he was still a mixed bag of sorts. Solomon is the third king, and as we will eventually see, I've already kind of showed you the hand here, but he started off well, but along the way he too 
was a mixed bag. Some smart people say that Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon in his younger years as a tribute to one of his many wives, and I don't know if you've ever read it, but it reads like a romance novel and it reads uncomfortably sensual in certain spots. And some people think he wrote that in his younger years, reflecting on the wonder of love and uh, marriage. He then wrote Proverbs, some think, when he was in his midlife, as he had learned God's wisdom and applied it to a bunch of different real-life situations. And then Ecclesiastes, some say, was written in his older years as he looked back on the whole of his life with a rather hearty dose of cynicism, pessimism, and realism about what ultimately matters and what ultimately doesn't. So Solomon was a mixed bag. At the same time, go to Matthew chapter 1, and you'll find out that Solomon is a distant grandfather of a guy named Jesus. So again, you just get stuck on, who are these people? They're certainly not perfect, and they're certainly not heroic. So I would say it this way. You see, it doesn't all just fit neatly into a perfectly square box where all the flaps fold just right and stick together, and we pick the box up and put it on the shelf. It doesn't work like that. Most of us are a mixed bag, except for the true saints, and there are some among us. The biography of Solomon, the biography of David, and for that matter, most of the characters we find in the Bible remind us God does his work through less than ideal people. Now, this is not to glorify the mixed bag. Of course, God desires holiness and purity of art. He wants us to be men and women who are passionately pursuing him and his ways. He wants us to be people who are conforming and transforming to his ways. Our, this is our calling as followers, and I don't want to dilute this with some sort of mixed bag anthropology. But God works in and through the lives of those who are a mixed bag and the Bible screams this message over and over again, and it comes screaming at us in the story of Solomon. He's at work in less than ideal people to move them along, to refine them, and to bring his grace and goodness and love more fully in and through them, and I find this hopeful. I have at times heard people, many times, heard people effectively deal themselves out of following God or serving him, or doing the work of his kingdom, wherever they may be, by claiming to be essentially poorly made. Not good enough. Not committed enough. Whatever the excuse may be. Just simply let this land. God chooses less than ideal people to do his work. Which brings me to the third and last thing I want to mention, and it's the simple idea that his grace is sufficient. It's a very tender word spoken of Solomon at the beginning of his life. 2 Samuel 12, it's what we read earlier, verse 24 and 25. If you're in your Bible, you can look at it. If not, it's on the screen. 2 Samuel 12, verse 24 and 25. She gave birth to a son, and they named him, back one, yeah, right there. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. Jedidiah means loved by the Lord. This might have been a nickname for Solomon. It might have been something they only called him in the intimacy of his family because we never find this name used for him again. But in the midst of all the chaotic and less than ideal circumstances, this little phrase, this little statement, this little truth the Lord loved Solomon. But not just that. God told the prophet Nathan to go tell David and Bathsheba that he loves their son. I find that hopeful. See, this is the goodness and the grace and the love of God breaking into the chaos. Do you see this? David has an affair. David commits murder. He and Bathsheba have a child. Bathsheba's husband is killed. The child they have dies, so they have a second one. And this whole thing is hard. This whole thing is painful. And God breaks in and tells the prophet to go tell them, God loves your son. 
I hope you can see God's work of redemption already begun in the midst of this broken story about broken people. The Lord loved him. I just love that. David by now had repented of his sins, but Bathsheba gets lost in the shuffle a lot. History has presented Bathsheba to be something of a seductress, what I don't buy for a second. No doubt Bathsheba's world was turned upside down when the king's servants showed up at her door one night and said, oh, by the way, the king wants to see you in his palace. So they haul her off to David's palace and they get, have their thing and she gets pregnant and then her husband is killed. And one imagines David and his new wife in turmoil over all that has occurred. It's confusing. It's hard. It's real life down in the muddy trenches but the Lord loved Solomon. God's tenderness and God's grace right in the midst of these difficult circumstances. Let me say it this way. God is there in the midst of the chaos. God is there working it out for his purposes, transforming this hard and difficult beginning for his purposes. The Lord loved Solomon. We might even say it this way. The Lord loves Solomon is the divine response to the human fear of being poorly made. So lean in, David and Bathsheba and Solomon, because God loves you even in the midst of the chaos and the challenges. Fast forward a few years, word is buzzing around in Jerusalem, and Solomon is hearing my mom and dad got together and my dad killed da 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 and David and Bathsheba saying, yes, son, that's true. But do you know what the prophet said to us right when you were born? He said, tell David and Bathsheba that God loves Solomon. God's word to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 is similar. As Paul is grappling with some less than ideal situation in his life, some less than ideal circumstance in his life, something in his life he doesn't want to be the way it is. He's grappling with this. He's struggling with this. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Think about what that's driving at. Think about the way in which that is God's word and wisdom and power breaking into a human soul that is grappling with a circumstance that is not the way they want it to be. And the voice of God says, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is amplified in your weakness. So lean in, Paul. My grace is sufficient to hold you and carry you even when the less than ideal circumstances don't get fixed. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, says a similar thing. He writes and puts it this way. In the same way, a Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man is enabled to repent and pick himself up and begin over again after each stumble because the Christ life is inside him repairing him all the time, enabling him to repeat in some degree the kind of voluntary death which Christ himself carried out. So, lean in, Mike. Lean in, you, because the Christ life is inside you, repairing you all the time, enabling you to repeat the voluntary death which Christ himself carried out. Sometimes, as we know, the less than ideal comes into our lives for unknown reasons. Sometimes it comes into our lives because we made dumb or sinful choices, and sometimes it comes into our lives because someone else made dumb or sinful choices, and it hurts, and the hurt can last a lifetime. But I'll leave you with this. But God was there, and God is there. So lean in, for his love is everlasting, and his grace is sufficient.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look carefully into the life of King Solomon, in the various details and the various struggles and the various failures, in the various successes, that you will give us eyes and ears to see and to hear who you are, what this life can be in you, and who we can become. I pray that your word, as we read it throughout the week, as we read through Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, I pray that your word and your wisdom will take root in our souls and actually, as it speaks to us, it will give us insight into the circumstances of our day. It will give us insight into the challenges we are facing. It will give us insight into the story of our lives. It will help us make sense of what you're doing in the midst of our own biography. I pray that the power of your word, the wisdom of your word, as we read it, as we absorb it, as we think about it, that you will use it to cultivate a heart in us and a depth in us that we have not yet known. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being here today and for worshiping with us. And uh, it'll be a fun adventure. This is, as Manuel mentioned in a time before, in a meeting before we met, this is a, this is a hard thing to dive into because this guy's life has got so much in it in the Bible. And we're going to try to pick different parts of it and zone in on what his example and life teaches us about our circumstances. So I hope you'll continue to join us in that. As you leave, may the grace and the peace and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Thanks for being here.